Greetings. Get your King James Bible. And we are going to do And They Worshipped the Dragon, Part 7. This is going to be the attributes of Satan, the devil, the accuser. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries, in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. All right, let's take a look at some of the attributes of Satan. I say we start in the book of Job. Job is arguably the oldest book in the Bible, the first one written. And um, I didn't believe that at first, but after having some people show me some things, I believe it's true. I believe it's the absolutely the first book of the Bible. But if you don't believe that, that's fine. That's just my opinion. And uh, my opinion isn't necessarily any better than yours. So what can I tell you? All right, so let's go to Job chapter one. We'll start from the beginning. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Some people say Job. That's all right. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed or hated evil. Now, was he perfect and sinless? No. But in God's sight, he was perfect and upright. And he eschewed evil. So he hated evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance, or his possessions, his substance also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen. 500 yoke of oxen. i tell you what, that, that, that will plow a whole big old area of land. I mean, do you know how much acreage you've got to have to feed 7,000 sheep, 300 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses? you got to have probably several thousand acres or so. You know, I, I don't know exactly. I'm not a farmer or anything, but uh, you got you to gotta have a lot of, lot of land area. And who's going to watch all these things? You, you know, you got to have people working under you. So his substance was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, and 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all, the men of the East. So at this time of the period, he was the probably the wealthiest of all the men of the East. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day. Now, I believe this is talking about their birthday everyone his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Now you got to realize something. The, um, the priesthood hadn't been invented yet, or I shouldn't say invented. The priesthood had not been given to man yet. Uh, that's, I, that's how I look at it. And offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all, for Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed, cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So Job was acting as a priest, doing intercession, uh, basically what Christ does for us, 
you know, we sin, Christ took on the burden of sin, and he stands between us and God the Father, and God the Father says the penalty for sin is death, and the Son says, Father, I've, I paid, I paid the price for that already. I mean, and this, this is basically what Job is doing here. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came, and Satan came also among them. Now, when you take a look at the sons of God, especially in Job 38 and Genesis chapter 6, and if you go to my homepage, you'll see playlists. And I've got an entire playlist on uh, the angels that sinned. Sons of God in the Old Testament refers to angels. Adam is called a son of God. But, you know, new, uh, believers don't become sons of God until the New Testament, until they're born of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is called the Son of God the only begotten Son of God. There's a big difference. Adam's called a Son of God, and Jesus is the only begotten, because he's begotten of the Father. So, here it is. The sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also, uh, came also among them. Now, I'm going to make a point here, and this is just my observation. Uh, Jesus, in a previous study we covered where uh, Satan was cast out of heaven. Jesus said he beheld Satan as he was cast out of heaven as lightning. And uh, in Revelation it says, And there was, was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the devil and his angels, and they were cast out into the earth. Now, there are people who say, well, you know, right here, the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. But it doesn't say where they were when they came to present themselves before the Lord. Were they in heaven? Were they on the earth? I, you know, it doesn't give you enough information here. I don't, my opinion, if you believe otherwise, your opinion's just as valid as mine, I suppose, you know. Um, you know, I don't claim to have all the answers. I mean, you know, when they asked Jesus when he was coming back, he said he didn't know, the angels in heaven didn't know, only God the Father knew when he was going to return in glory. And if Jesus doesn't know something, you better believe I don't. Verse 6, Now, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. I'm guessing they were on earth. Just my opinion. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? In other words, where, where are you coming from? Where are you coming from, big dog? As if, as if the Lord doesn't know, right? Then sent, Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Oh yeah, I've just been walking around, hanging out, you know, doing this and that. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth or hateth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, doth, God, uh, doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, does God fear you for nothing? Verse 10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him? Now what's a hedge? I did an entire Bible study on the hedge. It's a fence. Now what do fences do? Well, fences keep... Uh, bad things out and good things in you know if you've got sheep and you got a fence 
Well, it keeps the coyotes and the wolves out, and it keeps your sheep in. And what's a hedge? Same thing. You know, have you ever seen a thick hedge of thorns? Let me tell you something, people. That's even better. That's even better than a fence. Um, so, doth, God, doth Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Oh yeah, you've protected everything that he has, you've blessed everything he's put his hands to, and you've increased everything that he has in this land. Verse 11. Satan puts down the gauntlet. He puts out a challenge. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. So, God's answering the challenge here. He's saying, yep, you do whatever you want to do to him. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. In other words, he could touch everything else, but he can't touch Job himself. He can touch his children. He can touch his livestock, his, his property, everything. But he can't touch Job. Think about that, people. I mean... If God allowed it, Satan would kill every single one of us, I'm sure. And um, and you know what? If you've never had a satanic attack in your life, you're, you better question your salvation, really. I've had a few. But the Bible says resist the devil and, oh, let me look it up. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, when you're obedient to God, um, you know, Satan will attack you for a while, and then he'll get tired and maybe figures there's greener pastures every, somewhere else, elsewhere, and he'll go there. I don't know. That's just my, that's just my thing. Uh, so, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in thy power, in, his, in thy power. God's telling Satan he's in your, his power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them. Uh, who are the Sabaeans? I believe that's an old English word for the uh, Arabs. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. So the oxen and the asses, gone. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven. Think about that. You know, uh, Elijah called down fire from heaven on several occasions. He burned up two companies on two different occasions, burned up two companies of 50 soldiers that were trying to take him captive, wicked soldiers. He also brought down the fire of God from sky, the sky and devoured the sacrifice when he was challenging the prophets of Baal, or Baal, B-A-A-L, the Satanists of his day. And in the uh, New Testament, in the book of Revelation, I forget if it's the beast the false prophet 
or the man of sin, the Antichrist, whatever you want to call him, one of them, one of those brings fire from down from the sky and devours his enemies. I think it's the false prophet, if I remember correctly. So, God didn't bring this fire down. I don't believe. I mean, he says the fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. All right, here we go. Uh, let's skip over to Revelation chapter 13. I'm going to prove to you that Satan has power to bring fire down from the sky. Revelation chapter 13. We'll start in verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast, should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let, he, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. So this servant says it's the fire of God, but I don't believe it is. I believe it's Satan's fire, the God of this world. Okay, back to Job 1, verse 16. While he was yet speaking, there came an, uh, also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands. Who are the Chaldeans? They were the um, Babylonians. If you know who the Babylonians are, they took uh, Judah captive in the book uh, Jeremiah, book of Jeremiah. The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, boy, I tell you what, this must have been the, the worst five or ten minutes of Job's life. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind, a great wind from the wilderness. Uh, a tornado, perhaps? And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell. And it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. All right, so Satan controlled people, the Sabaeans. He controlled the, um, who were the other group? The Chaldeans. 
fire from the sky, and the wind. Okay, this, uh, this Satan character, he's not some little wimp that's, you know, <laughs> compared to us, he's pretty powerful. All right, let's take a look at the book of Mark. And uh, Mark chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he, he who? Jesus. And he was in the hinder part of the ship. He was on the back end asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Huh. Verse 41. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? You know, I would not be surprised if one day when we make it into the kingdom, we find out that Satan sent this storm to try to kill Jesus and the apostles. I mean, I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that's my possibility. So, all right. So Satan controls groups of people fire from the sky, wind. So here it is. Back to Job 1. Verse 19, And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. All his sons are dead. Now, I don't know if the daughters are dead, because it doesn't say, but it says the young men are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I take some faith, people. Let me tell you something. And everybody, and almost every church will tell you, oh, well, Job must have sinned and done something really bad for this to happen to him. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, yeah, God does perform judgment. And trust me, I've been spanked so hard, my rear end still hurts sometimes but um, nothing Job did warranted this this is just sometimes we're just tested this is a test and that's what this for Job and that's what life is people it's a test because you know what there's not one person in the world when they meet Christ either at the judgment seat of Christ or at the white throne judgment that they're going to be able to say in truth that they were never given a chance. Not going to happen. Especially the people that take the mark of the beast. Satan's job is going to be to trick people into thinking it's not the mark of the beast. Of course, that's what his, uh, his ministers on TBN and the 700 Prophets of Baal Club said. Uh, that's their job. So, 
Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. All right, we're getting close. Uh, in uh, the book of Exodus, the uh, chapters 28 and 37, it says, And thou shalt put on it a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre. What's a mitre? It's a type of hat. Upon the, uh, let's see, upon the forefront of the mitre, it shall be. Now, a mitre was what the uh, the priest would wear. If you don't know what a mitre is, uh, go take a look at the Pope when he's got that funny looking hat sticking on his head. That's a mitre, I believe. Exodus 29.6 And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head. All right, so in Exodus 29 and verse 6, And thou shalt put the mitre upon his head, and put the holy, holy crown upon the mitre. All right, so let's see. Let's go to the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. Now, we're getting close to 30 minutes, so I'm going to make this quick. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Sometimes the angel of the Lord is the Lord. Other times it's just an angel. Got to look at the context. And he showed me Joshua. Uh, the Jews will tell you, no, nah, that's not pronounced right. That's Yeshua. Well, Okay, whatever, you know. But this is Joshua. Joshua is not Jesus in this particular instance. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and, sta and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, You see, here it is, they're talking about the angel of the Lord. And then it says, And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Think about that. Our flesh body is filth compared to the Lord. That's why they're, he's going to give us white wedding garments when the marriage supper of the Lamb comes, right? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel and he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity, his sin, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. That's clothing. I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. Think about the the, you know, the white garments, wedding, uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. And the angel of the Lord stood by, and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou, if thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by, Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Remember Jesus said, uh, I am the vine, ye are the branches. For behold the stone, who's the stone? Jesus. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. His second coming, right? In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, ye shall call every man his neighbor under the vine and under his fig tree. The vine is indicative of Israel. The fig tree is a symbol of Judah. We're at 29 minutes. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to Jesus. In his precious name, amen.